you know, it's really hard to tell with those uh, trivias. Now, we did have a lot of fun Wednesday night, for those of you that weren't here. We did uh, trivia night. We kind of did it as a group just to have some fun. It was from an old, get this, DVD game that you controlled with a remote control. And it had Jeremy Camp, and everybody's looking at Jeremy Camp going, he's like 20, 25 years younger. <laughs> but it was a lot of fun. We learned a couple of things, I think. We also had some questions about interpretation of the question and the answer. It could have gone either way, but certainly it was a lot of fun. So uh, it was fun to have the trivia up there again this morning. We'll have to keep looking for more of those countdowns so that we can have that fun as we get ready to worship. So, But we are glad to see everyone here this morning. It's a little dreary out, and yes, we do have three to six inches of that fluffy white stuff in the forecast, but, you know, we do need the moisture. Uh, we are in the middle of a drought, so anything we can get will definitely help. Uh, if you're watching online and you haven't already, please give us a shout out. Say hi in the comments so that we know that you're with us uh, and hope that you can join us next week in person. This Wednesday night, join us for uh, Bible study and prayer at 7 o'clock. Uh, we'll be praying an extra special prayer blessing over Mark as he is uh, be the night before his big knee replacement surgery, which I know he is very much looking forward to and not looking forward to all in the same breath. So, and uh, that can be a, a blessing and, dis and it can also be a bit of a curse. So we're praying for everything to go well for that. On the screen, you can see eggs and bacon because we like more bacon. We also like to uh, get together as a group of men on that first Saturday of every month and have a time of devotion, a lot of food. There was even some leftover food yesterday and uh, certainly just the fellowship. And uh, we did have someone new join us yesterday and he fit right in, he was a car guy. And he knew some of the guys, so it was just been with us yesterday. Then following that, a week after that, already coming up, this is like too quick, four and a half weeks, five weeks, and we start season 19 of Orange Track Racing, so we're looking forward to getting that going. Uh, we do have to have a meeting here real quick just to discuss some potential uh, rule <coughs> changes to the classes, but beyond that, everything is pretty much set to go. Then we're going to fast forward. See, we're not... We're, we're, we've gotten all the business out of the holiday out of the way, and we got the movie out of the way for the first one of the year. We're going to take a little break after racing and uh, come back. And instead of men's breakfast on March 2nd, we'll be jumping into the cars and we will be caravanning down to Davenport for the Iron Sharpens Irons Men's Conference. It's a men's equipment conference that will be t taking place, like I said, in Davenport and we'll have sign-up sheets here in the next couple of weeks uh, so that we can get y'all signed up and ready to go. And like I said, we're slowing down a little bit on the announcements because that's really about the end of things coming up right now. Believe it or not, next month though, we do have Ash Wednesday coming up, so we're coming to Lent really quick as well. But uh, Mark will be posting up the uh, worship set list in the comments so that you can uh, worship with us online after the feed has ended and see, hear the music that Mark has curated to go along with the message this morning about overcoming adversity. With that being said, let's take a moment, pause, calm our hearts, and prepare our minds. Father God, we just thank you for the day that you've given today. We thank you that you allowed us to wake up today. We have thank you that you've allowed us to interact with others today and to make a difference for your kingdom, Father. Let us be your light in this ever-darkening world, Father. Father, as we get ready to hear a message, a message about overcoming adversity, a message that in this time, with all the things that have hit very close to home recently, with the school shooting here in Iowa, the death of a teacher here in Cedar Rapids, there's a lot of adversity going on, Father, and only through you can we overcome that. So we thank you, Father, as we prepare to hear your message today. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture this morning comes from James chapter 1, verses 
two through four. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Allow perseverance to finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. And Mark is going to expand on all of this. I'm just going to give a quick synopsis of what I felt this verse was talking to me about. But our, our greatest lessons in faith can often be found in our darkest times. We often say we hit rock bottom, but who is the rock? God. God is the rock. So God is that rock at the bottom, and he can lift us up. He is going to use those trials, those tribulations, to help develop us spiritually. And we really can't know the depth of our character until we see how we react to pressure. We're all really good when times are good, right? It's really easy. When things are going your way, you can treat yourself just fine. But how do you treat others when things aren't so good? These divinely ordained difficulties help us to grow and conform us into the likeness of Christ. It's kind of like we talk about heating up gold and melting it, and then you scrape off the gunk that's on top and leave the pure gold beneath it. In Romans 8, 28, 29, it, it says it pretty well. It says, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. He knew us. And he still chose his son to come and save us. And he went through all the same adversities that we did, but he did it without sinning. He did it without looking for shortcuts. So we've got to remember, don't try to shortcut God's lesson because you're not going to learn from it. God is working to make us spiritually mature and complete. It's through these conflicts that we experience in this world that we draw our attention to him. Instead of complaining about our struggles, let's see them as opportunities to grow. Father, as Mark comes up this morning, Father, we pray a special blessing upon him and his message that he has prepared this morning through your guidance. May we hear it, but not only hear it, Father, Take and use the lessons from it so that when we leave this place and we do come up against adversity, that we were able to look back at your scriptures, your word, just as Jesus did with Satan in the desert, and come out on the other side learning something new, becoming stronger and of greater character in Jesus' name. Good morning, church. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Good. Well, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. No matter what the weather is doing outside, it doesn't make a difference. And I just wanted to kind of talk about this because we're going through some pretty adverse times in the world today. And with all of the strife and with all of the problems, with all the infighting and politics that permeates anything you want to try and watch on TV nowadays. We see a lot of adversity. We see a lot of issues and problems. So I chose this graphic. And the reason is, you know, as we're in the darkness in here, God sends that reminder, that covenant that he made with his people, that he will always be there for us no matter what we're going through and no matter what the times bring to us. And so as we think about this message today of overcoming the adversity that we face in our lives each and every day, I want you to think about that rainbow. And I love the light beams coming out of the rainbow and coming down, show, showing the, uh, you can't really see it on that monitor, but on this one here, you can see where it's shining light back down into the dark places. And the scriptures tell us that, you know, there's darkness in the world, but behold, I am the light of the world and I have overcome the darkness and the darkness will not prevail. And so I want you to hang on to that thought process as we listen to the message this morning. And if you don't mind, after uh, running a vacuum cleaner last night, I kind of overdid it. 
So I'm, if you don't mind, I'm going to sit down to do the message today. So, but overcoming adversity, and uh, it's, it's really important. So as we reflect on the movie that we saw last night, and if you didn't have the opportunity to see the movie, let us know. We have the movie here. I'm going to leave it here, as I always do with all our movies. And if you want to take it and watch it at home, kind of as a reflection on it, or, or to see it for the first time, uh, it's here and ready for you to uh, take home with you. So as we reflect on the movie that we saw last night, we see that adversity comes in many forms. Um, and it would seem by looking at it, there is no one easy answer uh, or solution that we have for adversity that we face in our lives. So last night we saw poverty, a lack of resources in, in Jesse's family. Uh, we see bullying that came in many f different forms in there. Uh, we saw hidden family issues, um, that, which was Janice Avery, one of the characters in the film last night, which was causing her to be a bully, and I'll get to that a little more in a little while. We saw cruelty, you know, a toll charge, dollar to come in and use the restroom. You know, I love the thing with the little kids and they're free to pee. <laughs> I just got to say it. I just have to smile every time I see that thing because it was so funny. And then uh, finally, but last but not least, we saw a sudden and unexpected loss of life, loss of a loved one in there. And none of these things can be fixed with a single solution. And that's really what we experience in real life each and every day. Uh, so today I'd like to talk about overcoming that adversity that we face on a regular basis. And we all face adversity in one form or another throughout our lives. And we, how we deal uh, with that adversity, how we make the choices, how we decide to deal with that adversity really determines the trajectory of life's journey. And I talked about that at our men's breakfast yesterday morning a little bit. And if you would, I wouldn't mind if you want to before you leave today. Hopefully, if we need to, we'll print off some more copies. But there is a handout, our devotional from yesterday in there about adversity and how about dealing with adversity. And it's a little bit different take. And like I said last night, the script, the sermon this morning was 16 pages long. So I said, well, that's way too much. But boy, I'll tell you what, when you're going through this, because adversity is so huge. Dr. Jeremiah, I, I brought in a book that we got home last night, went out and got the mail, Encouraging Words for a Discouraging World. And his message this morning was on adversity. So when I prayed to God last week about what am I going to talk about this next Sunday, and adversity just kept coming back in, coming back in, the stuff we face in everyday life. Because I think we all, it, it all permeates our life so much uh, that we need to talk about it. So now, when we are presented with adversity, we have to make some choices. Number one is, how do we proceed in this given situation? How do we proceed with this circumstance that we're facing right now? Number two, how do we solve the situation? And number three, some of the switch situations are out of our control at the very onset, at the very beginning of them. So what do we do now? What do we do? Well, if you were to go out and ask just a random smattering of people out there, how they would deal with that adversity, most likely you're going to get a different answer depending upon how many people you ask out there. Everybody's going to have a different take on how to take care of that. But the problem with that is, that leads us right back to where we started. We still have the same problem. We still have the same issues that we had before. We're no further ahead in our quest for answers than when we first began. And see, that's what I want you to hang on to right now. If we go out and just ask anybody and everybody, you know, how do I solve my problems in my life, you know, they're going to tell you what they think the solution is going to be for them in their lives, how they would have to face it. So how many of those would you think that you would ask of those random smattering of people out there, let's say, take it to God first? Well, you could probably count them on one hand, right? So why not God first? Why not? Why not take him to the source of the person who can help you overcome that adversity best? Well, as I said in our, our devotions yesterday morning, I said, you know, a lot of the times, especially if we're facing sin in there, 
Um, we don't go to God first because, well, we think we can handle it better than God. Or that's the answer that God hears because we didn't go to him first. Ever think about it that way? A little bit different spin on it. But see, when we're sinning, God tells us not to sin. He gave us a whole list of things that, you know, if you want to be a godly people, don't do these things. And yet, what do we do? <laughs> we do what he tells us not to do. So what we're telling God is, hey, we know how to handle sin better than you. Because that's what God hears from our actions, our reactions, and the choices that we make in life. Because all of this is a series of choices. So for many of us out here, it's outside of our human nature. We're brought up to fix ourselves, right? You got to go in there. You created the situation. You got to fix it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that one. Uh, if this describes you, well, how's that working out for you so far? Yeah, right? <laughs> Not so well. Uh, but it was your choice, right? You have no one else to blame. Blame doesn't get you anywhere. It doesn't fix the issue. So I try not to do anything with blame. doesn't do you any good to assign blame to anything because it'll never right the situation. The situation happened in the past. You're trying in the present to fix it. And if you assign blame, you're going right back to the past and you're no further ahead. As a matter of fact, you're further behind. So based on our mental outlook, we can either take on the role of a victim or a victor, depending upon how we make the choice to handle that very situation. And that kind of goes back to what we had in our devotion yesterday. And it's how to handle adversity with the right attitude. And that's all part of this whole program in here. So let's go back to that. Why not go to God first? And I was pondering on the, the ways that different believers respond to opposition and adversity. And some Christians respond very successfully to adversity. Some do it right. And what I mean by successfully is that despite the adversity in their lives that they've gone through, they go to God first. In doing so, their faith is strengthened, their walk with God progresses, and they continue to draw close to him and receive his blessings and provisions for their lives. So you have multiple ways that this blesses you by going to God first. Now, a few minutes ago, I said, you try and fix it yourselves. And I said, well, how's that going for you? See, if we cut God out of the equation, then our faith does not get strengthened. Our walk with God will not progress. And we will not continue to draw into that close, right relationship that God wants Righteousness is what that's called, that right relationship with God. So if we don't rely on God, and we don't go to God, and we go to ourselves, guess what? We're going to end up right where we started, pretty much. And then we have to try and endure and endure and endure. In other words, uh, they do like, did, like Job did as he endured. Those believers that go to God, he said, God bless me once and he can do it again. See, despite all of the, all of the adversity of, and all of the problems, all of the trials, all the circumstances that Job went through, his faith didn't waver. He went back to God. But what did he do in the midst of the adversity? He thanked God. Thank you, God, that you're bringing me through it. See, that's where we, we go wrong. And I heard a quip on this this morning. Is a lot of times we go back to God day after day after day and we ask him for the same thing and the same thing and the same thing it's like God you're not doing anything in my life but what we need to do is ask him once receive the blessing from God and then we thank him that he is progressing that blessing through in our lives you know God I'm, I'm going to have surgery on Thursday I really need to have good results great I took that by petition to God it tells us in Philippians 4 to go and present everything to God by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. That's the part we always forget about. That's the part we forget about. So we need to say, God bless me once, he can do it again. Here, God, here's my prayer by petition. Bring me through the surgery fine. And then the next day, instead of saying, hey, God, I still have that surgery on Thursday, we're reminding him, 
of something he already knows. We already took it to him. So what we have is, God, hey, thanks. You're going to bring me through this surgery just fine. Thank you for blessing me with that. Thank you for blessing the caregivers that you're giving me. Thank you that my recovery is going to be somewhat pain-free. And we give God the blessing and the glory. We allow God to come in and work. And guess what? We have a different outcome than if we hadn't gone there to start with. And because believers believe that God will bless you once and he can do it again, they see that God will make a way than, they, than what they can't see themselves in any given situation. God will make the way through it. He will give us that covenant, that rainbow in the sky. He'll shine light down in the darkness. See, we call that blind faith. We don't see it, but by faith, we believe it. Blind faith. And that's what we need to have. We're all waiting for God to do this miracle in our lives. We're, we're looking around waiting for God to show out the miracle. But guess what? He's behind the scenes. He's working the miracle in the things we can't see. But we need to thank him for doing those things that we can't see. Blind faith. That's what we need to see. If we don't go to God first, we rob ourselves of that opportunity for God to bless us through the situation that we're going through. Now, for those who don't get God involved up front, these people usually overcome adversity in spite of circumstances surrounding it. But our, our whole point here is we need to let, God, let go of the situation and let God work. That's a key. Let go and let God work. See, in this example, it brings us not only joy, but also the needed confidence to face that adversity boldly boldly going, we become victors in the process instead of victims. Unfortunately, not every Christian responds to adversely successfully. Some people are defeated rather than victorious, and they face the various problems in life. As they're going through life, uh, they take on that woe is me attitude. Oh boy, you know, everything just happens to me. It's a horrible thing. They focus on all of the negative things. Instead of praising God and walking in faith and in perseverance, they develop that woe is me attitude, that negativity in their lives. They don't look for the rainbow for the positive things. And that adversity or the opposition has little positive consequence because of how they chose to respond to it. See, that was a choice. That woe is me attitude, that's a choice. That's a choice that you make. The adversity or the opposition has very little positive, positive consequences because of that choice. You didn't grow from it. You didn't learn from it. You didn't enhance your faith walk with it. You didn't allow God to progress through it with you. You messed out on all the blessings because you didn't involve God up front. See, it's, in other words, it's by choice that they decided to stay in the circumstance, in the negativity of the circumstance. And as a result, then they fall victim to the choice that they made. With that in mind, I'll share some snippets from you from Pastor Sarver. Uh, he's got a whole study on four principles for responding to adversity successfully. And Pastor Sar Sarver's first principle is, Christians should expect adversity. <laughs> Isn't that something to look forward to? And Pastor Sarver writes, I really believe that an essential key for overcoming adversity is to realize that it is the norm for the Christian life. This doesn't mean that believers should desire adversity or trouble. Don't get us into that mindset to look for problems. But what he's saying here is that this does not mean that we should consider every little problem or attack from Satan. I've heard that, I can't tell you how many times. People get into that mindset as well. It just means that we should realize that God blesses the people and love people, us, will undergo real adversity in our lives. So our scriptures do what? If we read the Bible, what's it tell us in there? It's going to be a fantastic life, right? No problems, no, no bumps or, or pitfalls in life. No, it tells us just exactly the opposite. 
It says, as a Christian, you basically become a target for Satan, directly or indirectly. He will oppose you and cause trouble through various means because and including other people, the government, health problems, financial adversities, family struggles, the list go on and on. It says, expect them. Expect them. It tells us over, over again in the scriptures. Expect troubles. Troubles are going to be here in the world. <coughs> John 3 tells us all about it. We'll get to that in a minute. Um, but what God wants us to do is he wants us to understand that Satan doesn't want us to have a relationship with God. He wants to keep you from it. And he puts barriers, troubles, trials, barriers, to that relationship with God. Now, you can let him win, or you can let God fight the battle for you. Anybody ever heard that song? Yeah? Scripture's in there. Tells us to let God fight the battles. See, he tells us over and over again. We just don't listen half the time. Again, though, the choice is ours to make. Whether we allow God to fight the battle, or we want to try and fight the battle ourselves. So Jesus himself in John 16, 3 says, In this world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. The Apostle Paul says that we must go through many hardships in order to enter the kingdom of God. We find that in Acts 14, 22. Apostle Peter said, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. No, they're saying, hey, you got to expect this. Expect that adversity in your life. Expect these troubles to come your way. But what do they say? So I like what James says in here. So we, we use that for their call to worship this morning. Well, James, the brother of Jesus, says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of many kinds because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Allow perseverance to finish its work. We always want that instant gratification, right? We want it to be over right now. Allow perseverance to finish its work. What does perseverance mean? We have to go through the situation. We have to persevere through it. Allow perseverance to finish its work. And then, and then what happens? Your faith develops perseverance. Allow perseverance to finish its work so that you may be mature and complete and not lacking anything. So every believer, if they're spiritual or faithful, no matter where they are in their walk with God and their walk with their faith will face troubles and trials. It tells us so right here. So if we then expect adversity, that will help us prepare to overcome that adversity successfully. Successfully. It doesn't say you're going to get trapped in it because this helps us make that choice. We know it's coming our way, so what do you do? If a storm's coming, what do you do for the storm? You prepare for the storm, right? We know that adversity is coming our way, so what do we do to prepare the storm? We get in a right relationship with God. We build that relationship with God. We strengthen our faith. Sound familiar? We progress our faith through the storms. We persevere through the storms. For example, uh, I expected my entry into business ownership to be extremely difficult. I knew it was going to be a challenge, so I prepared for it, and I was successful in doing so. But see, many others quit after only a couple of setbacks because they didn't expect to have those kind of hardships. They just thought, hey, I'm going to own my own business. It's going to be a cakewalk. Look at how many people start up restaurants. Average startup on a restaurant lasts two years. Two years. Most of the time it's because they weren't prepared properly to go into the business. If you don't prepare ahead of time, or I love the, the adage I used to teach us in business class, you're going to recognize this. She went through my business class. She's one of my students years ago. My disciple, there we go. Uh, oh, come on, huh? Uh, but one of the things that I would always teach at the very beginning of the classes was if you Failed to plan, you plan, plan to fail. fail. See, you remember it. 
How many years ago was that? 35? Yeah. Something like that? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. 35 yeah. years ago. She can still recite it. I love it. Not great like yours did. So, <laughs> success in the face of adversity in part depends on our expectations and our willingness to endure that situation. Perseverance. Okay? So, success depends on how well we are willing to endure or persevere through the situation. Again, it doesn't mean that we are going to stay in that position. It means we're going to persevere through that situation with the help of God. He'll get us through it. And he'll bring us out better than when we started. And I'll get to that in a minute. Pastor Sarver's second principle is Christians should, well, should persevere during adversity. During adversity. So here Pastor Sarver cites John Yates II, and in his book, Man Born Blind, entity states that life can be very unfair. People and circumstances can hurt you and steal from you was not rightfully theirs. At that point, you will have a choice. Back to the choices again. You can look back at what has been lost, or you can look ahead in faith for God to provide again. So you can either look back at the problem and focus on the problem, or you can look ahead to God and how he's going to provide the solution. You can either be a victim or a victor. It all is a simply a matter of focus. If we focus on that negative aspect, then you better, you better be in tune to be a victim. If we focus on what God can do with that situation to bring us through that situation, we can become victorious over that situation. I see a lot of times we lose sight of the blessing to come because we're so focused on the circumstance at hand. So here's another example of persevering and enduring uh, despite facing adversity. When he was seven years old, his family was forced out of their home on a legal technicality, and he had to go to work supporting them. At age nine, his mother died. At age 22, he lost his job as as a store clerk. He wanted to go to law school, but his education wasn't good enough. At 23, he went into debt to become a partner in a small store. At 26, his business partner died, leaving him a huge debt that took years to repay. At 26, after courting a girl for four years, he asked her to marry him, and she said no. At 37, on, uh, at 37, whoop, whoop, on his third try, he was elected to Congress, but after two years, he failed to be reelected. At 41, his four-year-old son died. At 45, he ran for the Senate and lost. At 47, he failed as a vice presidential candidate. At 49, he ran for the Senate again and lost. At 51, he was elected President of the United States. His name was Abraham Lincoln man that many consider to be the greatest leader this country has ever had. What we see here is he didn't just roll over and take it. He didn't just say, hey, this is my lot in life. Nothing good is going to come to me in my life. He didn't become a victim to his circumstances, but instead Mr. Lincoln persevered through the adversity. Look at all the things he went through. But see, in the end, he went from a victim to a victor. His faith journey was rocky at best, but when he called, when he was called to bring that nation out of civil war, his statement speaks volumes to this very day. Whereas it is the duty of nations, as well as of men, to own their dependence upon overruling the power of God, upon the overruling power of God to confess their sins and transgressions and humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures proven by all history, that those nations are only blessed whose God is the Lord. 
throughout all of the adversity in his life, he didn't lose his faith. He was proclaiming that faith to a broken nation. We had a war that pitted brother against brother. And he was reuniting them under God. Under God. So as we go into scripture this morning, I invite you to take your Bibles out and turn to Genesis 26, 1 to 33. It's kind of a long story, but it's one that I think we really need to hear. And it's probably one of the most overlooked stories in the Bible. Genesis 26, 1 through 33. And it's the story of Isaac and his perseverance through adversity. And I ask if you don't know the story, then to dust off your Bibles and read along. So I told these guys this morning, dust off the Bibles, put them on the seat. In other words, crack open the book and read along. So a severe famine now struck the land as had happened before in Abraham's time. So Isaac moved to Gerar, where Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, lived. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt, but do as I tell you. Live here as a foreigner in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. I hereby confirm that I will give all these lands to you and to your descendants as I solemnly promised Abraham, your father. Remember that covenant, rainbow covenant up in the sky? Keep that in mind. I will cause your descendants to become as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give them all of these lands. And through your descendants, all nations of the earth will be blessed. I will do this because Abraham listened to me and obeyed all my requirements, commands, decrees, and instructions. So Isaac stayed in Gerar. When the men who lived there asked Isaac about his wife, Rebekah, he said, oh, she's my sister, because he was afraid to say, she's my wife. He thought, they will kill me to get her because she is so beautiful. But sometime later, Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, looked out his window and saw Isaac caressing Rebekah. Immediately, Abimelech called for Isaac and exclaimed, She's obviously your wife. Why did you say she's my sister? Because I was afraid someone would kill me to get, to, get her from me, Isaac replied. How could you do this, Abimelech exclaims. One of my people may easily have taken your wife and slept with her, and that you would have made us all guilty of great sin. Then Abimelech issued a public proclamation. Anyone who touches this man or his wife will be put to death. When Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted. For the Lord blessed him. He became a very rich man and his wealth continued to grow. He acquired so many flocks of sheep and goats and herds of cattle and servants that the Philistines became jealous of him. So the Philistines filled up all of Isaac's wells with dirt. These were the wells that had been dug by the servants of his father Abraham. Finally, Abimelech ordered Isaac to leave the country, go somewhere else, he said, for you have become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away to the Gerar Valley, where he set up their tents and settled down. He reopened the wells that his father had dug, which the Philistines later filled in after Abraham's death. Isaac also restored the names that Abraham had given to them. Isaac's servants also dug in the Gerar Valley and discovered a fresh, new well of water. But then the shepherds from the Gerar came and claimed the spring. This is our water, they said, and they argued with it with Isaac's herdsmen. So Isaac named the well Esek, which means argument. Isaac's men dug another well, but then again, there was a dispute over it. So Isaac named it Sitna, which means hostility. So abandoning that one, Isaac moved on and dug another well. This time, there was no dispute over it. So Isaac named it, named the place Rehoboth, which means an open space. For he said, at last the Lord has created enough space for us to prosper in this land. From there, Isaac moved to Beersheba, where the Lord appeared to him in the night of his arrival. I am the God of your father Abraham, he said. Do not be afraid, for I am with you, and I will bless you, and I will multiply your descendants, and they will become a great nation. 
I do this because of my promise to Abraham, my servant. Then Isaac built an altar there and worshiped the Lord. He set up his camp at that place and his servants dug another well. One day, King Abimelech came from Gerar with his advisors, Azazet and Phicol, his army commander. Why have you come here, Isaac asked. You obviously hate me since you kicked me off your land. They replied, we can plainly see that the Lord is with you. So we wanted to enter in with a sworn treaty with you. Let's make a covenant. Swear that you will not harm us just as we have never troubled you. But we have always treated you well and sent you away from us in peace. Now look at the, how the Lord has blessed you. So Isaac prepared a covenant feast to celebrate that treaty. And they ate and they drank together. Early the next morning they took a solemn oath not to interfere with each other. Then Isaac sent them home again and they left in peace. That very day Isaac's servants came and told him about a new well they had dug. We have found water, they exclaimed. So Isaac named the well Sheba, which means oath. And to this day, the town that grew up there is called Beersheba, which means the well of oath. See, Isaac had quite a few setbacks. He had quite a few trials. He had challenges. But see, he remained faithful through the challenges. He persevered in spite of all of the difficulties that he faced. Isaac continued to face opposition and adversity. Every step forward led to two steps backwards. Now, what we need to keep in mind in ancient times, there were very few things that were as most important as wells because it watered the people. It gave life-sustaining. We hear a lot about life-sustaining water in the scriptures because people understood how important water was to their lives and their livestock. And also, keep in mind that in those times, it was an arid land where water was rare, and it was needed for people to keep the livestock alive and flourishing. Wells were difficult to dig during that time because of all of the hard earth and rock in the area. And often this was done without success. So for him to go from well to well and God blessing him by getting water in there, it was huge. See, in our understanding, our Western understanding, we don't understand a lot of these things. We don't understand how great the blessing was he was getting through these wells. But God was there, and he was faithful through the adversity. Through the adversity. And he would persevere through them. And these were a serious adversity and setbacks Isaac was facing. But despite the difficulties, Isaac did not throw down his shovel and quit. Nope, he persevered. He could have sat around and cried and complained about the disappointments of the past, but that would only lead to failure. He could have played the victim card, and who really could blame him at that point? But see, he believed that through the adversity, God would bless him. So instead, he chose to persevere through the difficulty and remain faithful to God. And then in the process, God was faithful to him in return. <coughs> so one of the principles I hope you take home with you today is if you want to be spiritually successful and experience the life that God intends for you, you will have to persevere during adversity. During the adversity. Pastor Sarver's third principle is Christians should believe that God will bless them despite the adversity. So in the second principle, I said that Christians need to persevere successfully in order to overcome adversity. And this doesn't mean that I believe human ability will overcome any obstacle and ultimately achieve success. That's not what I'm saying here. I don't think that believers should persevere because they believe in the power of perseverance but rather than they believe in the power of God. Because it isn't perseverance that is doing these mighty acts. It's God doing the mighty acts in and through us as we persevere through the difficulty. But the only way he can do that is if we involve him up front. If we 
go to him in faith and in belief. And we hold steadfast to that faith and to that, to that belief in spite of the adversity that we face. See, the believer is able to endure and persevere because they know that God can bless them despite the adversity. And this is what we see in this example of Isaac in here. No matter how many wells the Philistines stopped up or stole from him, God just blessed him again, and they dug another well. Until they finally gave up, as we saw in verse 22. They said, hey, we're, we're done. We, we see that God is blessing you. So what's happening here? To those people who weren't in tune with God, they weren't in a relationship with God, they saw that God blessed him despite everything that these guys tried to do against him. See, through your adversity, other people who do not know God are going to see God at work in your lives, and they're going to say, it is obvious to us that God has blessed you. And it wasn't normal to find those wells so easily. It was only by the blessing of God that this could be done. And in fact, Abimelech, who was the king over the Philistines, admitted in verse 28 when he said, we can clearly see that the Lord is with you. So here's the main point. We're only going to be able to overcome and endure adversity if we believe God can bless us anyway. So I mentioned Job earlier on. We know all that Job endured and all the, all the things that came against Job. But what was the ending of the story? What was the ending of the story? God helped him endure through all the sufferings, all of the loss, all of the heartache. And believe me, he had lots, lots more than filled up wells. Just like Job, who lost everything, God brought him back to more than double what he had before. We need to be able to say, God blessed me once, he can do it again. If we have that faith, if we go forward with blind faith in the, in the face of adversity, God will bless us and he'll bring us back better than what we were before. So, so far I've shared, shared from his first three principles for responding to adversity successfully. Number one, Christians should expect adversity. Number two, Christians should persevere through adversity. Number three, Christians should believe God will bless them despite the adversity. But the fourth principle I want to bring to you today is that Christians should recognize the good that can come from adversity. And this is where I want to take you back to the movie last night. So when we look at that movie, Janice Avery, if we remember her, she was the big eighth grade girl who was the bully, right? But what we didn't know was that, and what most of the people there didn't know, was that Janice was going through some pretty rough problems at home. Her father was physically abusive with her. He was, he was abusing her, he was beating her. And as a result of her home life, she acted out the same treatment she received at home and treated others how she was being treated by supposedly someone who loved her. See, children often mimic the behavior of their parents. This is very common and sometimes can span generations. A lot of times an abusive family relationship will span generation after generation until someone decides to break the chain. Few people act, uh, people act the way that they are treated for the most part. We saw Janice get a dose of her own medicine and it hurt her. She saw the pain. In the process, though, she grew. It made her see that being treated badly was not a pleasant experience. But what happened out of that was something very positive, something very good. When Jess and Leslie came in the hallway that day and they heard her crying in the bathroom, Leslie went in to console her and became a friend in the process. It made Janice rethink how she, how others were being treated, and it changed her very life. It changed who she was. Out of adversity came good. Out of that adversity came good. As we look at when Leslie died, when the rope uh, swing broke, it's really hard to see that anything good came of that. But see, what happened was Jesse learned what was truly important in life. 
and that healing comes in many, many forms. His whole family struggled with poverty and loss. He learned that they need to look to each other for strength and healing, and a stronger bond was formed out of that tragedy. Adversity comes in many forms. It's how we choose to address it, how we choose to deal with it, that will determine the outcome, either good or bad. God wants us to have a good life. He is only one prayer away. Sometimes he gives us wells in the desert. Sometimes he brings a little girl to show us the way. The problems in our life are an opportunity for others to see and glorify God through the choices that we make. In my examples here that I've had today, we see those who experience setbacks, opposition, failures, difficult situations. Yet in God's strength, in God's strength, they were successful at overcoming them. The same can be true of you and me if we apply those four principles in responding in how we make choices to the adversity that we face. And again, Christians should expect adversity. Christians should persevere through and during adversity. Christians should believe that God will bless them despite the adversity. Christians should recognize the good that can come What's our first step? We need to call on God first and receive his blessings. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we just praise you and thank you. We, we thank you that you allowed us to have this time together this morning, freely and openly. Lord, that you spoke to us and that you were here in this very room with us, guiding our hearts and minds to hear your message, to accept your message. And Lord, help us and be with us as we go forward into this world, this broken world, this world of darkness, that we can be a light, that we can be that beacon, that we can remind people of that rainbow covenant, that your light shines down upon us in the darkness and you dispel the darkness. And that darkness cannot overcome us. But help us to understand that we cannot do that alone that we need to call upon your name to guide us through that, that adversity, to bring us through better than when we started. Allow us to receive those blessings and search out you in the midst of adversity to help us endure through it. We praise you and thank, us, thank you today for all of the great and wonderful things that you do in our lives, all of the blessings you give us. Let us recognize those blessings and be thankful for them today. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we get ready to take communion this morning, I'm reminded of in the movie when the, our three main children are riding in the back of the pickup, which is something we can't do today. <laughs> Some of us grew up riding in the back of the pickup. But they were having a conversation. They had been to church, and Jess is just taken with this whole Jesus thing. And they got to talking, and she mentions Jesus is death on the cross and having his hands and feet. Leslie. Leslie. Jess was fit. <laughs> Leslie's talking about the uh, Jesus' hands and feet being nailed. And uh, the other two thought, oh, that's just awful. It's just such a terrible thing. And she, never having heard the message before, found it to be beautiful. So as we take communion this morning, Let's try and see the beauty in Christ's death from her point of view. It's a beautiful sacrifice that he made for us. He knew what was coming. You want to talk adversity? Getting your hand, getting beaten like he did and then nailed to the cross? That's adversity. 
But before he did so, as he always taught, he served. He washed the disciples' feet. And then they shared a meal together. And during that meal, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And a little later in the meal, he took the cup. And after blessing it, he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. My blood poured out for many. Scripture tells us that each time that we do this, we have to do so until Christ's return. And many are praying for his return every single day. But my prayer is, yes, I would love for him to come back today, but not before that last person accepts him. If you've not taken communion with us here in person before, make sure you open the bottom part first so that you don't end up wearing the liquid. <laughs> the body of Christ broken for you. Take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Lord, we just thank you that in all things we can come to you. No matter what is bothering us, what is facing us, what we are coming up against, that you, you Father, have our backs. You're walking beside us and when necessary, you're carrying us through each and every situation. Father, let us learn from each trial that we go through, each test, and as the saying says, Father, let those tests become our testimony. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. your healing so praise God for that is there anyone else who would like ask for prayers this morning yes as always with the bad weather coming in we'll pray for the houseless yes yes I will is there pray for my wife too she's oh. got a migraine and a bad back oh no I'm gonna have to take her to the body shop I think <laughs> <laughs> no that sounds terrible but we'll pray that God heals her for that all right, in Psalms 9:11, sing praise to the Lord, enthroned in Zion. Proclaim among the nations what He has done. We praise you, Father God, for all the amazing things you have created, especially for the beauty of this earth for us to enjoy. You leave nothing undone. You are in every detail of life. You have created our inmost being and have intricately woven us all together. There are no words to describe how much you love each and every one of us. You lived among us and died on the cross to save us from ourselves. You rose three days later and hold eternal life in the palms of your hands. For those who choose to follow you, they will see the beauty of the kingdom of heaven. We thank you, Jesus, for giving us unconditional love that we can have a personal relationship with you through prayer. And as we pray for each other today, Lord, please let the Holy Spirit move among us. And Father God, I lift up all who were in the mass shooting in Perry, Iowa, and their families and friends. I pray for your Holy Spirit to dwell among them and wipe the tears from their eyes. Give them the peace that passes all understanding and help them to heal their hearts and minds as only you can. You alone can turn evil into good, so let it be so in your powerful and holy name, Jesus. Father, I want to lift up Leanne and Trudy Carpenter's daughter. Trudy went home to you Friday, a blessing she has been praying for since her husband passed. I pray you will comfort Leanne's heart, mind, and soul, and give her strength for each passing day. And we thank you, Father God, we lift up Deb this morning. We just pray for healing for her back and her migraine, Lord Jesus. Get her to place a place where she needs to be for a doctor's consultation if she needs that. 
and help her to get the healing that she needs. Thank you for her life, Lord Jesus. And Father, I lift up Mark for his surgery for his knee on the 11th. I pray the Holy Spirit fill that surgery room, guide the doctor's hands, keep everyone at peace. Give them knowledge and wisdom to do the perfect surgery to correct his issues. Please supersede the healing process with little or no pain and quick healing. Father, I lift up Betty, Candler, and Donald to you. She is fighting cancer and in the final stages of life on this earth. Please give her courage, mercy, and grace as she faces each new day. Give Donald peace in his heart as he helps his mom through this trial. Father, I lift up Carla and Lori's mothers to you today. I pray for healing, that your healing hand be upon them. May they rest in the reading of your word and promises for them. Guide them and comfort them daily. Father, I want to thank you for our children and grandchildren. Let your love guide them through this life. I lift up the homeless. I thank you for their lives. I pray for shelter, food, comfort, and kind Christian people to help them in their trials. I pray that any wrongdoing against them will be corrected. I pray you guide them daily and help them know they are loved. In Psalms 9, 9 through 10, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. And today, if you want to receive Christ into your heart, it's a new day, a new year. So pray with me. Lord, I accept you into my life. Let the blood of Jesus wash over me. Cleanse me from me from this day forward. I will serve and worship you. Create in me a pure heart and a willing spirit to praise you and sustain you all the days of my life. To you I lift up my soul. Thank you, Jesus. Let your will be done in me. In Jesus' holy and precious name. wonderful to, I, I look forward to hearing your prayers every week. They are truly a blessing. And so at this point in time, as we come to the close of our online portion of our service this morning, uh, please go back and listen to the music that we've uh, curated for today. Um, hopefully it'll speak to you the way it spoke to me when I was picking out the songs. There was so many songs to pick from. It's hard to narrow it down to like four. Um, but truly, hopefully they'll speak to your heart today and then give you something that you can carry forward with you as we go into the world. So let's just go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord God, we come before you today. We confess that we are sinners and we're in need of your grace and mercy. We repent of our sins and pray for forgiveness. We pray that by the power and the love and the blood of Jesus that we can be redeemed, that we can be made whole in you again. Lord Jesus, we ask for you to come into our hearts. We make you our Lord and Savior today. We thank you for your blessed assurance that we will be with you in heaven, that your spirit will give us strength, that it will give us guidance and hope and love to be your disciples in this lost world. Lord, we lift up our lives. We lift up our church, our city, our state, and our nation to you. We ask that you would do a mighty act of healing in us and in the world and that your works would be done. Lord, embolden us today to step up and step out to bring home the lost, to bring home those weak, to be bring home those who are oppressed and facing adversity. Lead us to growth in your spirit and keep us unto you. In your precious name we pray today.